one of the biggest issues with bridges are, you know, is they are hack points, right? They're very vulnerable to hacks and those are big places to target. What I really like about Gibridge and what we've implemented from the beginning is the isolated security model. Because like even if something happens with one specific blockchain, for example, like vulnerability or the problem with consensus algorithm, that will not anyhow influence the security of funds or like security of uh, protocols integrated with the bridge in all other chains. Hello everyone, my name is Ben and as usual, I'm the host of today's podcast. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Alex Smirnoff, the co-founder of The Bridge. Welcome to the show, Alex. Hi Ben, hi everyone. Uh, nice to be here. It's so great to have you on, right? So, you know, before we begin, we always like to start off with, you know, uh, tell us who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get started in crypto? Yeah, of course. So my name is Alex Smirnov and uh, yeah, I'm CEO and co-founder at Debridge. I'm a builder myself. I'm a tech guy. I used like I was doing PhD in mechanics and mathematics. Um, yeah, I was I was like my PhD thesis was about like inertia and satellite navigation. And back in 2016, I found out about the blockchain. And my journey started from the BitShares community. I was a part of it that started to develop some really simple blockchain, blockchain connected applications and like first dApps back then. And I just like got super excited about the blockchain technologies. I, I had the feeling that like financial revolution is coming and I want to be a part of it. And uh, like back in 2016, I like fully graduated the postgraduate department of my university, but like I dropped out of my PhD three months early before the defense because like I wanted to be a, like a full time, full time involved into the Web three industry, and I thought like okay, I will defend my like thesis later on. Just like right now, I need to be involved in crypto, and yeah, so that's how the journey started. I I was part of Bitchers community, then I was part of Steemit. Steemit was like very first social network uh, based on Steam blockchain. Then in 2017, uh, together with another co-founder of Debridge, Yaro, we founded Phenom, the blockchain development company where we developed like different blockchain connected solutions and decentralized applications. We also had fun participating in different hackathons. And yeah, so in 2020, we finally realized that we got enough expertise to start our own project and one of the problems that we were struggling with was the cross-chain liquidity transfers because like the exchanges we were the only way like to pass liquidity between blockchains especially back in like 2020 and exchanges like ask many questions sometimes like pros to the accounts and uh, the process of transferring liquidity was like very unpredictable and that's why we thought like okay we need to solve this problem in a truly decentralized way and that's how we like came up with the idea of the project we are working on right now of debridge we participated in the global chain link hackathon uh back in april last year we won the chain link hackathon got the first place place among more than 140 projects worldwide yeah and ever since then we started like, to be fully focused on building debridge and uh, yeah, that's what where we are right now. Like the protocol is live, and we are just like uh, keep working on the cross chain adoption and bring us closer to the fully decentralized cross chain future. Yeah, I mean, you kind of gave it away, right? And it's the name itself, uh, the bridge. So obviously, you guys are a bridge, but uh, there's been a lot of talk about bridges nowadays because you know we have so many different chains. Everyone's talking about cross-chain to operability, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we hear it all the time. So, you know, can you give us a rundown what uh, what is Keybridge focused on? You know, what makes you guys different? And for example, could you share which how many cross-chain trampers you support now, for example? Yeah, sure. So Debridge is a generic messaging protocol 
and a cross-chain interoperability infrastructure that enables transfers of arbitrary messages and liquidity in the same transaction. So basically, we provide an infrastructure and framework for projects and developers to solve any, any kind of cross-chain needs. And this framework can be also utilized to tap into various cross-chain opportunities, such as cross-chain compatibility with the smart contracts. Because normally we saw all these money legos that were assembled within one specific blockchain, for example, Ethereum. We saw like Curve and Convex, like DAI integrated with Aave. But like the main mm -hmm. challenge was like, how do we assemble all these money legos of the cross-chain landscape? And uh, yeah, that's the problem that Debridge solves. So we enable like, global compatibility between uh, different protocols and smart contracts when let's say the smart contract on Ethereum can start to interact or open up positions on protocols in any other chain, for example, Solana. And uh, yeah, on, like developers and projects can start like build more capital efficient solutions by combining protocols from and smart contracts from different chains. And one of the solutions uh, that is built on top of the bridge was built by our own team. It's called DSwap. That's the solution that enables like cross-chain swaps between arbitrary liquid assets. So if the asset is liquid, if it's traded somewhere, it can be swapped into any arbitrary asset in another blockchain. So yeah, cross-chain swaps is just like one of the potential applications for cross-chain interoperability. Uh, we also enable like bridging of any arbitrary assets and data in a single transaction. And of course, another big niche would be the bridging and interoperability of NFTs, because we mm -hmm. saw more games that are coming uh, in a crypto space and Web3, like gamify industry is getting momentum. And of course, it's also important to have the like, ability to transfer, bridge various NFTs between different blockchains, as well as make NFTs interoperable between gamify projects. And that's another problem that we are solving for uh, projects and like games in general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you said, there are many use cases, but you know, I, I just kind of want to dial it back and you know, try to understand the basics. Because you know, when people think of bridges, they just think, oh, I want to transfer, you know, E from, for example, from Ethereum to Arbitrum. But uh, from what you're describing, the bridge is a lot more than there. It's more than just transfer assets. Uh, people can send messages across uh, different chains, meaning you can build protocols on different chains and they can interact one of them, which is, I guess, the next step of what a bridge will look like. Yeah, exactly. So like many people get the not fully correct understanding about like what bridge is, because like originally we saw the bridges as a purely like technologies or projects focused on value transfers, right? When you're mm -hmm. just like as a user, you provide asset in one blockchain, you receive like asset or like the wrapped asset and another chain, then you'll need to swap that dropped assets. So that's how like many people are thinking about bridges. But in general, like bridges are way more than that. And I would classify bridges, all the bridging technologies into two groups. The first group is like group of projects that are that are mainly focused on a cross-chain value transfers. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, they, they are like, fully B2C focus, like to enable users to perform across chain swaps. All these bridges like have their own TV and liquidity locked in the both side of the bridges. And uh, I really believe that like this type of bridges will have to pivot toward the generic messaging protocol the, or they will have to leverage or integrate with generic messaging protocol. Otherwise they're not going to survive because like there is no way to efficiently utilize liquidity locked in in the mm -hmm. bridging protocol itself. Whenever bridge gets some TVL, it has to compete with the big liquidity projects such as like Aave, Compound, or Frax. And that's not the competition that bridge is gonna win. That's why I'm I'm more bullish on the generic messaging protocols because these protocols can be compatible or like composable with another DeFi, uh, with other DeFi primitives and projects. And they can source liquidity from those protocols when it's really needed. And generic messaging protocol would be uh, represented by the group of projects such as Debridge, Wormhole, Layer Zero, and Axelar. I would say mm -hmm. uh, these are like four main projects from this specific niche. And uh, the main advantage here is like that all the generic messaging protocol can leverage existing DeFi ecosystem, even though not not like not not all of them are doing that. So, for example. 
how Layer Zero is building their own bridge, which is called like Stargate, and they have their own liquidity locked in the protocol. And uh, the utilization of liquidity is not really efficient. So you may have like $4 billion of liquidity, you pay liquidity mining rewards uh, to all LPs who supply this liquidity, and the utilization is like just 1%. And uh, like economy should work, right? And there is no way to build like really capital efficient economy whenever you have your own TVA. That's why like in DeepBridge, we are a big advocates of the compatibility. And we truly believe that like bridges do not need to have their own TVL at all, because like the only uh, moment of time where when, liqu when liquidity is really needed for bridge is when the cross chain transfer is performed. And instead of like having liquidity locked in the TVL and smart contract, bridges can source liquidity from other protocols when it's really needed. And that's the approach we are taking. So we integrate, for example. Uh, working on integration with Aave, with Portals, to source liquidity from Aave whenever a cross-chain swap is performed, as well as with other protocols such as My, Frax, and others. And that's the way to, like, the new kind of generation of bridges, where the entire DeFi ecosystem will be, like, more united, less fragmented, and capital, like, the flow of capital will be way more efficient. Yeah, I mean, from what you described, it sounds like you're building a mini aggregator, like a DEX aggregator, and you're pooling liquidity from a bunch of different protocols into your bridge, which is uh, really interesting because um, I, I personally never realized that. But yeah, like you said, uh, most bridges, you have to have uh, liquidity locked in. Uh, I've had my fair share of being stuck on one chain, trying to leave it when there's no liquidity there left. And yeah, I mean, it solves a lot of issues as well, right, I assume, because one of the biggest issues with bridges are, you know, is they are hack points, right? They're very vulnerable to hacks, and those are big places to target. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, in overall, like, security is one of the most sensitive topics here, because, like, many projects were trying to build their own bridges, and many people were thinking that, like, building bridges it's like building the multi-sig. You just like got like five out of 10 uh, signatures and that's it. But like, in fact, building your own bridge is like very complicated challenge. And my number one advice to everyone is like, never build your own bridge and never build your own <laughs> cryptography because that's not like easy challenge to solve. Even if you're building your own blockchain, like it's always better to be kind of composable and instead of reinventing the wheel, instead of like building your own bridge, just integrate with projects and teams who are like fully focused on uh, building interoperability technology because the area is quite challenging and all the bridging solutions are more or less dependent on the security models of the underlying blockchain because all, all the interoperability protocols <clears throat> are basically a middleware right the middleware mm -hmm. that interconnects different blockchains and in case something happens in one blockchain that may uh, influence the entire ecosystem of the bridge like all the chains to which this specific bridge is connected that's why for bridges there are like so many security measures that should be implemented and um, what i really like about the bridge and what we've implemented from the beginning is the isolated security model because like even if something happens with one specific blockchain for example like vulnerability or the problem with consensus algorithm that will not anyhow influence the security of funds or like security of uh, protocols integrated with the bridge in all other chains and there was like actually vulnerability found in optimism where the guy like Saurik received $2 million bounty payout. And that vulnerability allowed like to mint any arbitrary amount of asset on chain. And uh, theoretically exploited, that vulnerability could withdraw the liquidity of like 98% of the bridges in all the chains. And, that, and that's very dangerous. And uh, that's why I'm really uh, kind of saying about the isolated security models, because otherwise the entire like DeFi and crypto ecosystem uh can become uh kind of can be exploited by the attacker so yeah that's just like one of the things that should be implemented by every bridge that i'm thinking about but in addition to that there is like two uh general directions in a sense mm -hmm. of security the first one 
is the set of security measures that are laid into the protocol design itself. And here, for example, in DBridge, you have the validation of the state consistency. So in fact, it's like a balance sheet validation. All validators are continuously checked that the state of the protocol in a smart contract uh, is the same as the state calculated in a debridge node. And in case there is any deviation between like balances calculated in the, and in the, the smart contract, validators immediately stop validating transactions for this specific chain. And uh, yeah, so that's like the basic balance sheet validation and some bridges would kind of minimize their damages uh, if this specific uh, balance sheet validations would be implemented. Other things uh, include the validation of like non-sequence. Um, mm -hmm. That's like every smart contract that, that is passing through a bridge should be enumerated, right? And the yeah. validators of the bridging technology should like consistently can continuously check the ascending order of these like serial numbers of each transaction. Because like in case there is like 51% attack or, or the problem with consensus algorithm, there will be collisions like in this non-sequence or duplicates. Mm -hmm. And for example, in debris validators continuously monitor this uh, uh, data and in case there are any duplicates, like immediately stop validating the transactions. And uh, yeah, there are many more things on the protocol level, but in general, like security should, should be treated very seriously and there should be like security audits. There should be uh, good understanding, like who controls the protocol authority, who is the signer of the multi sig. Because in addition to mm -hmm. like general vulnerabilities in the smart contract, we saw quite a few bridges that were compromised due to the lack of like decentralization or due to poor mm -hmm. key management. And that's why, like, there are so many aspects that should be accommodated. And uh, of course, like the smart contracts and security models should be audited by some reputable value, uh, auditor, auditors and security companies to make sure that bridge is like truly secure. Yeah, you, you know, uh, great points right there because I was just about to raise up. Yeah, you know, we had two big bridges, right? Uh, the wormhole was one and uh, XC Infinity as well, the Ronin bridge. And uh, it's kind of two different examples. Right? One is, I'm not too sure how the wormhole hack was executed. It's more technical in nature. It's more of a, a flaw of vulnerability. But uh, the Ronin bridge was just pure lack of decentralization and a social attack. From if I'm not yeah, same with harmony. Yeah. Uh, same with harmony, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like you so said, as for yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just about to say, you know, bridges have a lot of things to think about. It's a very scary prospect. You are essentially controlling the fine. If you are like the only bridge, you're controlling the entire economy of the chain, more or less. Exactly. Yeah. That's why, like, if you build the bridge, like, in case you decide to do that, you should be <laughs> fully focused and dedicated to this process because, like, yeah, there are so many things that should be taken into account, and not, not only on the smart contract level, but also, like, on the infrastructure level. Or like the there should be the proper key management, and um, yeah, like decentralization is like really different aspect of it. And for example, what I like in the design of our protocol is that like validators for like validating transactions, they never expose their IP address, so they never expose their infrastructure because like all the validations happens off chain, mm -hmm. and uh, validators do not need to sign, do not need to broadcast any transactions. What they do, they just like sign a unique identifier of the transaction, their private key, and store the signature in IPFS to make the signature accessible by everyone. So no one knows the IP address of the validator and uh, like it just like purely kind of data communication and validators do not need to communicate with each other as well. They just like store signature and that's it. That's why there is no way really to get validators compromised. I'm going to take a step back and you know, talk about the bridge again because you know now we are in the bear market. Uh, I'm sure there are some new challenges uh, on top of what you already talked about and how hard it is to build a proper bridge. Um, so I'm just curious about how the team is 
uh, handling this? Are there any particular, is there any particular challenge um, that you have when building? Yeah, I personally think that like bear market is a time of opportunities because yeah. during this specific cycle, we saw that like DeFi is way more than C5, right? And what we are focused, mm -hmm. we are focused on building like DeFi infrastructure and DeFi ecosystem. And we are actually building toward the solution for all the C5 problems. And it was really funny to see like the, that the first uh, who received the funds back is all the defaults of all these big C5 companies who are like protocols. The first like to get funds back were like, mm -hmm. for example, in Celsius, like MakerDAO received all the funds. Ava received all the funds. It's like like retail users and like private creditors are those who will have to like go to course and uh, struggle for getting their funds back. Like, but DeFi ecosystem itself is working really great, and that's why what I'm excited about. And yeah, as I said, like this specific bear market is the time to build, uh, time to find the market feed to work on various integrations and make like these money Legos because like all the protocols and developers are becoming more accessible because before like during the, the bull market, everyone is a bit overwhelmed. Like there are so many users, there are so many mm -hmm. like projects and investors who are reaching out and now it's time to focus on building. And yeah, for me specifically, it's like the third bear cycle. And uh, mm -hmm. it's like, it's very clear that crypto is here to stay, right? Yeah. Um, and um, in deep breach, like we don't we don't have that many challenges. It's just like the overall activity in the ecosystem uh, became way lower. I mean, like less transfers are performed, users became less active. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I really like encourage everyone to keep building, keep exploring DeFi ecosystem and overall protocols to be active members of different communities uh, because like. The bear market is like a temporary thing, and it's like needed mm -hmm. to kind of wash out all the speculation to only like leave projects that are like healthy that are building toward the decentralized future. So yeah, we don't like specifically the bridge. We give like bear market does not change anything for us. <laughs> we keep working on our specific goals. We work on the adoption, on integrating with different projects and protocols, because as I said, like we are a big advocates of compatibility and one of the like distinctive features of the bridge is that we never wanted to reinvent the wheel so unlike many other bridges we never built our own mm or dax but we for, we for example like partner up and integrate it with one inch to source liquidity and routing algorithms mm -hmm. from one inch protocol so we basically use like liquidity aggregators within one specific chain but cross chain we utilize our own algorithm to find like the most capital efficient road for a cross-chain liquidity transfer. And we're also working on the integrations with like bigger liquidity protocols such as Aave, for example, like in Aave V3, they introduce really interesting concept of Aave portals where Aave can like allocate the credit line to bridging protocols that can be used to settle cross-chain liquidity transfers. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited about like all these kinds of integrations because it enables like way more capital efficient solutions and uh, enables better decentralization. And bridges in general change the way the users will interact with the protocols. Because before, like as a user, like overall interaction with different dApps was kind of nightmare, right? Because like as yeah. a user, we need to think about like what wallets we should connect, whether it should be, mm -hmm. should it be like MetaMask or like Phantom, like what chain we should use. Uh, but because like in Web2 world, whenever we interact with a website, we don't need to think about like hosting provider, all the traffic mm -hmm. is routed automatically. I think the same experience, uh, user experience will achieve in the Web3 world as well, where bridges will act as a kind of TCP IP stack for the internet of blockchain. And all the dApps will follow application centric approach where instead of like deploying the protocol in all the different chains, they will have to pick just one that best suits their needs in, in terms of uh, like throughput, transaction fees, security, and maybe ecosystem in general. And protocols will deploy in just into the one blockchain and for technologies such as Debridge, they become like accessible from the from all the other chains. And as a user, mm -hmm. for example, I can get used to use like my Phantom wallet 
but at the same time from my phantom wallet i can interact with the dApps and protocols on polygon or an arbitral without thinking like whether i should uh switch wallet or switch network or like what bridge i should use it all will be like routed automatically and uh, yeah so that's like the the next innovation in a cross-chain space i think will be about like user experience in addition to mm -hmm. security of course and compatibility user experience is like very important aspect and uh, in order to onboard the next billion users into DeFi, we need to make sure that the user experience and overall onboarding process is very seamless. Yeah, I mean, you know, you kind of cover what I wanted to ask next because I was thinking about what underrated issues there are when it comes to bridging. And like you've shared, oh, you know, you can envision a future where protocols do not need to, uh, you know, copy paste their protocol on different chains. Now we kind of see that now, for example, uh, Uniswap is on Polygon, ETH, uh, and I think uh, one of the other L2s as well. So yeah. from what you're describing, you know, next time you just need one Uniswap on ETH and uh, they can conquer ETH and, you know, other protocols do not need to step up because if they wanted the liquidity from ETH, all they need is the bridge. Uh, yeah, but it also depends on the type of the protocol because like for every blockchain ecosystem or for layer two, we need to have some kind of foundational layer of DeFi. And that foundational yeah. layer includes like lending protocol, DAX, like Rotor, and like sta stable soul protocol as well. And um, those are protocols where like synchronous compatibility is needed, right? So for example, mm -hmm. with Aave, we need to like take a flash loan and execute some complex logic in the same transaction. So like with certain protocols from the foundation layer, uh, there should be like deployed in many chains because like they enable this kind of synchronous compatibility. But with 95% of all other protocols, they like they don't need to be deployed everywhere because mm -hmm. they just like they can pick one specific blockchain and then get a global accessibility and asynchronous compatibility with the protocols from other chains. And that lead to like less fragmented liquidity environment because like whenever like protocol is deployed in six blockchains, the protocol ha have to manage liquidity and like uh, kind of control liquidity and like user interactions with the protocol in all those chains, which is like not user friendly. And liquidity fragmentation is one of the big problems. But instead of doing that, I feel that like the paradigm will gradually shift toward the application centric mm -hmm. approach where like a the protocol just deployed in one chain that can be like blockchain uh, app specific blockchain for example avalanche subnet or i don't know the mm -hmm. specific blockchain within cosmos, the cosmos ecosystem. as well yeah a lot of yeah. that chains are coming online we saw that with dydx yeah and that was yeah. quite interesting they were just in our previous podcast so yeah i had a talk with them as well <laughs> cool yeah, yeah. Yeah. So maybe we'll see like even more chains, but like all mm -hmm. these chains will be like application specific, but at the same time through interoperability protocol, they will be globally accessible. And that's quite interesting as well. So yeah, can't wait to see like how DeFi landscape will look like in like three years from now. Awesome. You know, so before we just close the session, I think we covered quite a lot, but I just want to ask, is there any question that I should have asked but did not or is there anything you like to share in particular before we end the session uh no you actually asked like really great questions and <laughs> uh, yeah i think we, we like covered a lot maybe the only question that we may discuss also is like how how do projects like bridge their assets to like to other blockchains and there are a couple of ways to do that like there can mm -hmm. be like dropped assets um our projects just like utilize bridges to have like locking and meeting mechanics. But another way of doing that will be like utilizing of like native assets when instead of like using the wrapped one, projects can deploy their own token in other chains and utilize generic messaging protocols to control the like minting and burning mechanics across all the chains. Um, but yeah, it's just like only the case where like projects and protocols need to create some utility for their assets and other chains. Um, yeah, I think that's that's about it.
Yeah, cool. You know, just on that note, because uh, one example I can think of, uh, which I interacted with, was actually the Layer Zero NFTs. They had some ghostly ghost thing where they were kind of minting and burning the NFTs on different sections. Um, but do you see the same happening for you know just regular tokens as well? Like non-NFTs? You mean bur bur yeah. burning and minting? Yeah, because ultimately, like I think one of the biggest problems now for bridging are wrapped assets, right? Because uh, one protocol may have their own version of a wrapped Bitcoin, then you have wrapped Bitcoin 1, wrapped Bitcoin 2, wrapped Bitcoin 3. Uh, you fragment liquidity even more, which is kind of annoying. And you know, from what I understand, this is one of the problems facing Osmosis as well. Uh, we had a session with them way back where they had this discussion on, you know, how many bridges should we actually let connect with us? Because if we let more than one, you just have liquidity issues again because everyone has different wrapped assets. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, very good point because I personally think that all these wrapped assets should only be used as an intermediary, mm -hmm. uh, kind of intermediary step during the cross-chain transfer. Because it, whenever like projects or like some another like layer two is launched, they need to have their own like native asset, and then they just like let all these wrapped assets to be swapped into the native one with up to certain limits. So, for example they allocate like 10 million dollars limit to one specific bridge and this like only up to 10 million dollars of these wrapped assets can be swapped to the native one and that that allows uh these ecosystems to have a risk management even if like some of the bridges will compromise the potential damage is like will be like limited with this uh limits that were allocated to each specific bridge so yeah like users will not even care about the brand mm -hmm. assets exactly. the only thing that like users want they just like pick the asset that they want to receive and uh, all mm -hmm. the routing all the like underlying swaps from the wrapped assets should be performed under the hood and one of the powerful uh concept of the generic messaging protocols is that instead of like bridging wrapped asset you can kind of transfer the message which encodes a command to like source this liquidity from some protocol or like to mint this specific native asset and it just like oh, it all about the risk management so like whenever the new ecosystem is launched they should have like the main native asset and then like allocate specific like routings through rob assets into the native one and if they integrate with the generic messaging protocol then this kind of routing can be enabled through messages instead of like wrapped assets so yeah it's all about like what what assets will be the main one mm -hmm. and what assets will be like most traded in the most popular DEXs. yeah um yeah you pretty much answered everything i guess and i think that's about it thank you so much alex for coming on yeah, thank you, Ben. Like, very good questions, very insightful conversation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. For the latest crypto prices, visit our website. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up to date on the latest crypto trends.